Hey, Derek. Hey, what? Got to do the thing. The... What I want you to do is you're going to take your hands. No, 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 no. I'm God. Done. Next. Premature no, no, ejaculation. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're deep into I was going to have you do this. Be- got, got wildly I was inappropriate. going to have you clap behind your head because that's rear wheel drive and that's kind of not. Re- we're doing an episode on front wheel drive. Can you hear that? You can't hear that. They can't. I might have been out of frame. Anyway, okay. uh, welcome this to the Carmudgeon Show. Episode, yes, is about. Did we say Hackett Podcast Network? No. I, I, you interrupted me and you said this episode is about. So you can just say the whole thing. I'm on strike. Um, Carmudgeon Show, Haggerty Podcast Network, part of the. Uh, this is. <laughs> 72 episode front wheel drive <laughs> we'll start over ladies and gentlemen welcome to episode number 72 of the carmugian show my name is jason space camisa and this is derek tam hyphen scott and today we're going to be talking about front wheel drive and how it sucks or doesn't oh thank you depending on yeah. the circumstances yeah there are a lot of circumstances there's a lot of bullshit in this episode yeah we're, it's a little bit aimless but i think ultimately entertaining aimless have you have you watched this show before yeah, okay. A lot bit aimless. Perfect. If that's the biggest problem you have today, then I would say you're in <laughs> good no, shape. No, I'm dragging ass. Hmm. Not unlike a front-wheel drive car, where the back of the car is just dragging. Mm ass <laughs> speaking of dragging ass i'm just uh, gonna take a nap now <laughs> well i have a monologue go for about it. front wheel drive do you no i'm not gonna have a monologue about it but oh, you should i'll just sit here and watch uh my which gosh camera which camera's me i don't know um <clears throat> so yeah we're gonna talk today about why front wheel drive sucks and yet we both own multiple front wheel drive cars Oh, yeah. Multiple. Oui, c'est vrai. Oui, c'est vrai. I have not seen evidence of this French car yet. but uh, I'm Moi with... non plus. <laughs> you've, not, you've never even seen it? No, no, no. I saw it and drove it, but it's getting a timing belt service, and it is taking its sweet, sweet time. French cars have timing belts? Yes, this is the Douvrin motor. Oh, God. We're going to get a lesson in the Citroën CX. Merde. <laughs> Merde alors. Um, uh, no, so the original... Mo- so the, so en français, s'il vous plaît. Originalement, la voiture, uh, le CX, est arrivée avec une moteur uh, de DS. Merde. Moteur de DS. Ah, moteur de merde. Avec des push rods. <laughs> I'm sure uh, that it is the now. cam dans le bloc. Uh, le cam dans le bloc is not a way to say the cam is in the bloc. And I'm sure some francophone somewhere is filing suit against you for, <laughs> for defaming. For criminal uh, crimes against, crimes against the, the, the nation of France, of, of, against the francophone world. <laughs> uh, so the CX, like the DS before it, arrived with a motor that did not... Um, live up to the promise of the rest of the car. Oui. They sort of developed the whole car and then they just couldn't get the motor across the line. So the the DS I learned recently was originally supposed to have an air-cooled flat six. Get the fuck out. Really? I shit you not. I and glad to hear that. They tried, <laughs> good, because we've got another hour here and it would be a... Never mind. It's unpleasant. <laughs> um, so the God. it was supposed to have an air-cooled flat six. Uh-huh. I'm just pushing the limits here. See if we can't get cancelled one way or another. Um, And, (laughs) well, two weeks without an episode, a couple of years, some weeks ago, people were like, did you guys get cancelled again? Um, No, COVID-2022. So they couldn't get the flat six to work. And so it ended up with a development of the Traction Avant motor, which is the predecessor of the DS, uh, which was an ancient motor that had come out in the 1930s. The Traction Before. Traction avant, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. All of these are front-wheel drive cars. There is actually something related. This is not a. This is somewhat tangential. We. Oui. Um, and so the the DS got a new motor. It came out in 1955, and it got a new motor in the like 67 ish, I think. My God, uh, that took them that long. Yeah, to replace the traction avant motor, which had Jesus. been around, I think, since the 30s. Uh, and then the same thing happened when the DS was replaced with the CX. They were like, "Ah, shit! We were going to put the Maserati V6 in." Actually, no. It was supposed to have a rotary in it. Uh, But the rotary thing proved to be immensely problematic for almost everybody, 
except, of course, the Japanese who sort of made it function. Uh, have you talked to anyone who owned a first-gen RX-8? I would As, say that was immensely problematic. Oh, I had to turn my car off before it was fu- fully warmed up. Therefore, I now need to remove the plugs on the side of the road, get underneath it to do so, and dry them off because it flooded itself. RX-8s were not. Reliable. That's like not a rotor tip seal problem, though. No? It was a fuel condensation starting. Anyway, yes. That's why Rotaries NSU are all went away. Mm-hmm. NSU does not exist anymore to this day because of the failed efforts to do a rotary engine. So anyway, they did do a, Citroen did do a rotary engine poor experiment with the GS, also front wheel drive. Do you know um, what else was supposed to have a rotary engine? A rotary. Hold on, um, I think it's not front wheel drive. We can't talk about it. The DeLorean was supposed to be a, a mm, rotary. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's why they got that. So much engine behind the rear axle. They're like, it's going to be so little. Doesn't All matter that junk inside that. your trunk, trunk, trunk. Here's the thing. Is we're trying not to drag ass uh, in this episode because we are recording this one after lunch. Yes. And every time we record an episode after lunch, halfway we through, we're like, a nap. Yeah, what is with us? Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Post prandial. So. Uh, so the CX was supposed to have a rotary engine, but it, they couldn't get it to work. They made 1,200 GSs with B-Rotor motors. And then a million of them with, with flat fours, air-cooled flat fours. Uh, all of that to say that the push rod motor from the DS was used in the early CXs, actually almost all the way through the CX. But they came out with a new two-liter engine with um, overhead cam for 1979. And it has that, that has a timing belt, and mine is that motor, and it's getting... It's a pretty replaced. early application for belts. I mean, Do you know the first car that had a timing <laughs> belt? It's going to have to be something it's French. It's very obscure. It's not Talbot French. Talbot something? No. No, it's not, it's not French. What year are we talking here? Decades. 1968. Really? That was the first ever Yeah. Belt. I mean, I'm going from my, my, my mental... The, um, the V6 Dino motor was not timing a belt. Chain. That was a chain. Mm-hmm. You're not going to guess it. It's a very obscure car. Even if I say what it is, you'll be like, what? A what? See. It, it was uh, badged as a BMW. That's a hint. In 1968. Yes. Something that was not a BMW was badged as a BMW. It mm-hmm. wasn't Isetta. That was too... No. Eight cylinders. It's a glass. A what? Glass. It's half GLAS. full. <laughs> My glass is half full. There was, does a, not there have was a, a thing belt. that was badged as a, a BMW <clears throat> that had eight <clears throat> cylinders. It was front engined and uh, it, it had a timing belt. Wow. Okay. Now you know. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Nugget so, yes, in 1979, timing mm-hmm. belt, uh, it, this engine was also used in the Renault 25, I think, and also the 25. Peugeot. I learned also that in Sp- España, they pronounced Peugeot as Peugeot. Peugeot. Um, uh, 505, I think, got the same engine. It's an overhead cam timing belt in line four. 505 in the U.S. was a 1.9. No, that was a 405. It was 2.2. Mm. Um, yes, that's <clears> right. The 2.2 <throat> version ended up in the 505. Huh. God, that engine um, was in The Duvra motor, named because that's where the facility was. In any case, this is all very dull. The purpose of this is... <laughs> to <laughs> Leave that up to our listeners to decide, because I'm sure voting they'll put comments peace, in there. Yeah. Voting for not listening to the podcast with their, their ears. Average listening time, what are we, two minutes and 12 seconds <laughs> of the podcast? <laughs> um, because front-wheel drive is supposed to be sort of naughty, like a bad word. You know, in the car sphere. So I, I just want to go smog the Lotus. And my my big smog check is a big anxiety thing for me because it's like you're going in. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Your car is running great. And you go to do an emissions no test on, on it. No, well, most of my cars don't have lights. But it's always a fucking shock because you're like, everything's great. It's getting great gas mileage. It's running perfectly. It starts, it runs. And whoa, holy shit, did I fail badly. And then you fail so badly that it then in California. Labels you as a gross polluter. Right, which is obvious. Story of my life. Right. And then you have to like do special smog treatment, a, a smog test every two years. So it's this huge anxiety thing. And my biggest thing is that I will never allow the Lotus's battery to die for multiple reasons. One of which is because I don't want it to reset the monitors because you can't smog check a car, an OBD2 car without having the, the monitor set. And I've watched friends literally spend a year or 10 months or seven months or whatever it is trying to get the monitors to set just to pass smog. So I unplug it off of the tender and I pull it out of the garage to take it to the smog shop 
and the fucking check engine light goes on, which of course now means whatever it is, I'm going to have to fix and then I'm going to have to reset, which means I'm going to, it's going to take forever. Uh, it turned out it was, I just didn't tighten the gas cap. Oh, and the light came on. And the light came on. And so I had to reset it. And it, it That's my favorite car repair ever. <sighs> I was fixing a check engine light with a fuel cap because mm-hmm. it's so catastrophic and it's such an emotional roller coaster from going I won't be able to drive it like, again. I'm going to have to junk it. I know. It. I have to turn it in. <clears throat> I, it's going to get turned into a metal cube. Right. And, and then you fix the... I, you just I bought go a, click uh, and you're done. Yeah. I bought a, um, a Range Rover, an L322 Range Rover. And that happened as soon as I picked it up. And then, thank God, it was just the fuel cap seal. Okay. So I had bought a new fuel cap for like 40 bucks. And then you put that, the seal is usually even cheaper than that. Sorry, I'm turning do not disturb on my phone because a, a phone call was about to appear on that screen. Oh no. Yeah, that would have been embarrassing. Everyone would know Gross. that the IRS is calling me demanding money. Um, <laughs> so, But because the Lotus has a Toyota engine in it, it re- set all of its monitors. I checked it 35 miles later and everything was set. So it was all good. The car passed, but everything's good. But, but I did spend a week driving nothing but the Lotus just to kind of exercise Animate it. Animate it. And got got out of it. I'm like, mm, I'll swap it out for the cabbie. And the cabbie, I haven't driven all year. Like, I just have not had a chance to. I I, I think I drove it once, other than driving it back and forth every once in a while from the warehouse to the house. And I completely fell in love with it. Like, I think I made it onto the highway. So I did kind of trail break in because I was catching a yellow tail end of a yellow light. So trail break did. This in light the, was thoroughly and red. I, it, <laughs> statute in 21 years when the statute of limitation expired i would probably agree with you but right now it's very fucking green uh-huh. with a tinge of yellow and so i kind of trail braked it in and i'm like oh my god this thing actually handles better than the lotus in terms of like gr- limit behavior it understeers less than the elise does and then i sort of it was mostly warmed up like oil was at adc and i sort of wound it up to f- like five or six grand through second third and then fourth and then slowed back down as i merged on the highway and i'm like you know what the the cabbie is orders of magnitude more fun than the Lotus is. And that's a fucking mind fuck. That's a very controversial statement. <clears throat> it comes down mostly, handling well in society, it comes down mostly to the charismatic nature of that 16 valve engine that I put in the cabbie. But I, I have a lot of front wheel drive cars. And so do you. And so, you know. No, I, I don't. You have two front wheel drive cars. and the, That's not a lot. You put the predominance of all of your miles on a front wheel drive car every year. You choose yes. a Golf. That's true. Yeah, same here. Uh, but I think I have only owned four front wheel drive cars out of more than 50 cars. I'm trying to think. I probably should add up mine. I don't have all that many front wheel drive cars either, but I kind of like them the best. Here's, Do you okay. have three? I mean, are we counting the 1994 Hyundai XL? That's no. The, okay. Are we counting the minivan? Oh, please not. yes. No, please not. You that, always count it. <laughs> You did that whole stunt about I bought a new car and then it counts. It's more worse fair than the Ferrari. It then you does. have to you have to bear that cross. Uh, so yes, you have four front no, wheel. In terms drive of cars? collector cars that I own. I mean my Well, my, collector cars. Fuck. You're trying just get. trying to qualify. In terms of cars that were built between March of nineteen eighty four. No, no, and I don't have it. No. <laughs> That, well, that's well, don't be July absurd. of what happened in March of 1984 that's that's of any consequence no all right so my Scirocco which I've owned for 25 years is front wheel drive mm-hmm. the cabbie is front wheel drive mm-hmm. the e-golf is front wheel drive so three. and the minivan you counted it it has to count now okay so four out of 11 five well five out of 11 if we're counting the Hyundai which we shouldn't because I shouldn't even talk about this at some point you guys are going to see it it's going to be for sale it's the most amazing Excel in the world I don't know if I've talked about it because we missed one episode that we had to delete and delay and I don't whatever we're very confused over here anyway 72 episode 72 this this one is episode 72 yeah but when we replay 70 yeah we're very confused Seriously, even even Paolo's freaking out over there. Like, ah, um, okay, but of my old cars, only two of them are Volkswagen front wheel or front wheel drive, and they are the same car. Um, they're mechanically identical. <clears throat> but so growing up, before I started to drive like a lunatic legally, I you know I'd read car magazines <laughs> <Or> illegally, <laughs> really, really. I'd read car magazines and I found that the, the journalists that wrote for Car and Driver and Road Track had a really hard time explaining what the drawbacks were for front wheel drive cars. I mean, Or that they explained it in a way that did, they were just like, it's worse. It's Everyone always preferred rear drive. And the, the reason why they preferred rear wheel drive is because it pushed rather than pulled. And that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. 
I have not encountered that that sort of linguistic construction recently. I have encountered it, but not recently. Okay, I was going to so say maybe you, it's not in service anymore. <clears throat> well, okay. So if you had to explain to a layperson, a person you were laying, um, your side piece, um, or so your main romantic, piece, that'll definitely get you laid. <laughs> Let me tell you all about front wheel drive and why it's inferior. <laughs> More cushion for the pushing. Oh, okay. for fuck's sake. What? No, <laughs> it's less digging. cushion. Is it more, more cushioning or less? What? Derek, Tam, hyphen, Scott. I'm sending this to your parents. They'll be like, there's so much shit of my son mouthing off on the internet. I have no interest in listening to any more of it. Yeah, but now, you're, now you've crossed a line. Uh, now okay. we know hyphen is a sexual woman. 94 year old. <laughs> uh, it was a very long, elongated Fuck, you like the foreplay, don't you? Anyways, you want to cross the line. <clears throat> Welcome to the other side. Front wheel drive. Front wheel drive cars. Okay, if you had to explain <laughs> to someone you were not laying, but who was a lay, lay person, well, how do you describe the difference? What, what's the drawback to front wheel drive? Um, also, I'm going to lean over and turn the air conditioning on because it suddenly got very warm. warm? <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed. That was a little bit, you know, over the line. Yeah, that was past the line. There's a turbo button on here. It beeped. It's gonna, we're going to ice This is a front wheel drive episode, not a turbo, <clears throat> turbo episode. We already did a turbo episode. No, no, no. Turbo is on. the button on the air conditioning that probably just increased the background noises to levels which Paulo is not going to like, but fuck him because, you know. You don't want to die yourself. of hot. Uh, heat stroke. Uh, front wheel drive is the topic of this episode. And Should we start it over? I asked you a question what, and I meant Oh, what it. were the disadvantages? Yeah, what does your okay. side piece say about me? <laughs> <laughs> so weight distribution, front wheel drive cars, because all the mechanical systems are in the front of the car, often come with front biased handling. And so that can be somewhat like problematic. Uh, the other thing is that I think you're asking too much of the front wheels. If you're asking them to brake, steer, and put down power. Uh, are you really braking and putting down power at the same time, though? Well, you are. <laughs> Depends on the car. Sometimes <laughs> I will brake. I, I do left foot brake. Uh-huh. Okay. The point of all of that is that the front tires have to do everything. And there is a fixed amount of, of grip available to the front tires. And if you are asking them to, say, turn and put down power at the same time, that's a compromise, especially with high horsepower situations. There's also, in the past, have been issues with like torque steer and sort of control while putting down power. That can be challenging, especially if it's a, a peaky turbocharged car. See exhibit Mazda Speed 3. Oh, first gen. Um here, let's go back to a second for the fact that you're asking the front wheels to turn, but you're not asking the rear wheels to turn because I think if you weren't asking the rear wheels to do anything in a corner that would have the same effect as say putting a bunch of cafeteria trays or on the back wheels or having an Ikea shopping cart that does this, no directional stability in the rear. So you're always asking the rears to, you're asking all four corners of the car to actually assist in the gripping of the car. I'm blowing holes in your argument sure. so we can discuss the positives of front wheel drive. Um, but uh, let's see. There's a fixed amount. Of, so so you're saying that's you're a saying traction that circle a, you're talking a, about. Yes. And in, in a rear wheel drive car, you would say that there's actually no material difference between asking front wheel drives to turn and put down power simultaneously versus just turn while putting down power. Uh, the act of physically tur turning the front wheels by, by way of the steering wheel does put an additional burden on the front traction tires. Demand. But, but it's that's not that there's no burden on the rear. Yes, sorry. Not known <clears throat> burden. That, yes. that, that is a, a technicality which I should absolutely be corrected on. I don't even know if that's true. I just made it up. But it sounds right, right? It's got to be right. No, it's true. Because you, you, right. you, 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 you point out that if the t rear tires had no traction, then it would be like... Uh, Ikea shopping cart. Right? You know the guy yeah, 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 yeah. with casters the casters at the back, which is the fucking dumbest. What asshole did that? Somebody with very narrow aisles. You need to be able to pivot. I understand why. Okay. So... Uh, all yeah. of those, th all of the points that you make are valid, right? Torque steer is an issue, certainly as cars get heavier. Um, but actually, to me, the biggest drawback in front wheel drive cars is simply weight transfer. Yeah, putting down power, unloading right. the front tires when the weight transfers backwards. Right. The more, the harder you're accelerating, the more weight on the car transfers to the rear wheels. Which means the less normal force on the front tires, which means the effective amount of grip decreases. Decreases. So the, the harder you accelerate, the less grip you have on the front wheels and the harder, the more power you're trying to put to them. Whereas the opposite happens on the rear wheels. The harder you accelerate, the more That's weight on them. That's why 911s, even rear wheel drive, have really good grip. 
Yeah, dump a clutch at 7,000 RPM in a 911 and it will still fucking take off. It barely can break the tires loose. So um, to me, that's the biggest difference. Up into the point where you are breaking traction because you no longer have enough weight over the driven wheels, there really isn't that much of a difference between a front-wheel drive car and a rear-wheel drive car. There's no feeling of mid, pulling and pushing. Mid-corner balance due to weight distribution? Okay, all can be tuned out. So Even you, if you have like 65, 35? How can you get a 911 to understeer? Yeah, there's and no weight on the front can. tires. Okay, but then you then you're saying there's no weight on the front tires is understeer, and then there's too much weight on the front of the front wheel drive cars. It doesn't work. You can tune anything. Well, it out. depends on the, I'm, this, this throttle position. Dependent. Right, exactly. So what you're doing is <clears throat> when you're in the middle of a corner, you can add you can add and subtract power, right? So you can add a, add add a load or put a negative load drag on on the driven wheels, <clears throat> which will obviously affect weight distribution, but also then can overcome the grip of those tires. So for example, you're coming into a corner and you're at the, let's say you're at the limit of all four wheels. You have a car that's neutrally balanced, meaning all four wheels let go in the corner, so front and rear at the same time. Um, and in a front wheel drive car, you add power. What you're doing is up to the point where they start to skid and, and, and really break through, you're actually transferring weight to the back which is reducing weight on the front, which is inducing understeer. You're also asking the tires to now, to your point, in the traction circle, do two things at once. Turn the car and also put that power down, which reduces putting the more power you ask them to put down, the less grip they have available for, for turning. So you're also inducing understeer. So anything you do adding power in a front-wheel drive car will induce understeer and ultimately slow you down. In a rear-wheel drive car... That's not necessarily the case because you're adding power. You're unloading the fronts, which can induce understeer. But if you add power enough in the back, then you can reduce grip in the back through wheel spin. And therefore get the car to oversteer. Mm -hmm. Right. So rear wheel drive cars will tend to induce understeer as you're first adding power. And Until then we'll transition. The moment when you have, right. if assuming you have enough power. To overcome them and then you have oversteer. So what that does is give the driver an additional tool to change and switch back and forth between understeer and oversteer under power and also allows the car to accelerate out of the corner, putting a lot more power down than it would if it was trying to put those to the front wheels because you're transferring power back under acceleration, therefore you have more grip. So really up until the point where you get to the limit of grip and the limit of adhesion, you don't really notice much of a difference between a front wheel drive and a rear wheel drive car, which is why I think defining it as the feeling of pushing and the feeling of pulling is just asinine. It's yep. just not the way it works. Okay. Um, and unfortunately for that demonstration also, you put a limited slip differential on a front wheel drive car and it actually tightens the line under power. So I have a Torzin diff on the Scirocco, not on the cabbie. So the cabbie's got a mini slip as a 2.5% limited slip from the factory. <clears throat> if I'm coming around a corner, that car's fairly well balanced. It barely understeers, but it does understeer. And if I get on the throttle, it doesn't, an open diff would just spin the inside wheel insufferably and you don't go anywhere. This one car, one wheel peel. One wheel peel. This car with a Volkswagen's mini slip will, will not spin the inside, but it will spin both of them and just push you wide. The Scirocco with a limited slip spins the inside. Uh, slower spins the outside faster than the inside and therefore it starts to lock them together and will actually tuck in mm -hmm. so it'll reduce understeer which makes it really fucking fun because then you can you know you can just foot on the floor through a corner and it will pull you at a higher grip level than it would be able to do without any power on and just yank you through a corner fucking funny shit Yes, that's quite an enjoyable sensation. I believe my golf does the same mm -hmm. thing. Your golf has, though, uh, I think. It's just, all it is is it's, it's it's an electronically controlled, controlled clutch. limited slip, right? So basically, what it's doing is very it has variable amount of clamping force between the two front wheels, and when it's fully locked, the fr the two front wheels will spin at exactly the same speed, so you don't get that spin up on the inside. Um, and now, then you have overdriven. You have cars that will do, be able to do torque vectoring up front. Will over be able to overpower one of the wheels. Mm. Uh, do we have any front wheel drive cars anymore that'll do that? I don't think so. Uh, yes. Well, the first one, the only one that I can think of is the Prelude, the Square Headlight Prelude Type SH Super Handling. If you mm. remember that, mm -hmm. you know what? Which Prelude? Yeah, I'm the last about? Prelude. Mm -hmm. um, that Type SH had a overdriven torque vectoring front diff, huh. so it could actually overdrive one of the wheels. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yep, they were they were quite good handlers. But you super don't, handling. <clears throat> Super handling, in fact. That's uh -huh. what Honda says. Um, and then there was SHAWD when they took that diff, put it in the back of For an all-wheel drive car. Right. Um, but I've never owned an all-wheel drive car 
because I like to break traction. Mm. And that's, I think, one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, if you enjoy breaking traction, front wheel drive can actually be a lot more fun than rear drive because you can do burnouts and not go anywhere. Like e brake plus front wheel burnout is a lot of drama for, like, I had some guy in my neighborhood the other day. And, you know, I know you shouldn't shit where you, shit where you eat and whatever blah 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 some guy just in, in a i don't even some silver pickup truck thing stopped right in the middle of the road just stopped and so i stop and i flash my lights at him and i hear abs behind me some inattentive soccer mom and some enormous suv almost killed all of us and you know this is a 25 zone and i think we were probably doing 12 i mean like it was you know he was going slowly and then stopped so i lay on the horn he flips me the bird and then turns his right turn signal on and makes like 140 degree right hand turn into the driveway that he had missed how was i supposed to know that's where he wanted to go he didn't use his turn signal so rather after this escalated from a you know a light flash to a horn honk what else do i have to do well i pulled the emergency brake and dumped the clutch from six grand and did car cabby definitely not the cabriolet uh, this was a professional driver closed course moment. I was on a racetrack and this happened and a guy stopped in a pickup truck and there was a soccer mom and it's a very strange group of cars. It was a lemons race. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what's left to do? You just pull up the e-brake and just, wah, bah, 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 and just cover everyone in smoke and leave. That is a dramatic exit and a step up the ladder from just, you know, the normal flipping him a bird, which he deserved. But you could do that in a rear wheel drive car too. But you go places. Like the whole idea is I'm in a, I'm in a residential zone derek i mean not I if you're doing a proper burnout you don't go places in a rear-wheel drive car it's a pain in the ass with a manual but yeah fair enough it's also more abusive in a, in a rear-wheel drive car because you have that weight transfer and then you got to hold the brakes so your argument is that despite the fact that we have been in doctrinated that's the word i'm looking for indoctrinated with the doctor. idea that your name is dr derek damn hyphen dr hyphen no that's my parents no um we have been indoctrinated with the idea that front wheel drive is inferior, but you think that it's a conflation with other characteristics that are often paired with front wheel drive cars. I mean, if you go back to the eras, call it the 80s, when you look at cars that are front wheel drive, there's not a lot of like, I don't know, dynamically enjoyable front wheel drive cars. Do you, or do you think that they're all only driving around in cars with more than, I don't know, what the threshold back then was? You got a, oh good, verifying OneDrive app. It's your OneDrive party oh, that you've been... If anyone from Microsoft is listening, fuck your company. This episode is sponsored by, by Microsoft, by Apple, whatever. Uh, um. <laughs> but I mean, so the, the limit, I, the limit of, of ability to deliver power to the front wheels has increased over time as people have gotten increasingly clever with tires and technology. So the, the, actually, I think it's gone the other way. So cars have gotten vastly heavier and vastly more powerful. And the other thing is they've gotten taller. So when you have a, a tall car that's very heavy and now like the like like the minivan, I'm, I'm working against my own uh, <laughs> argument here. You didn't but, buy it for dynamic reasons. This is true, but it did just keep up with all the photo. We just did a, a shoot where uh, I had to I had the camera guys yelling at me to slow down when I was in a bunch of cars because those Michelin Pilot Sport all season fours outgripped half the cars that we filmed was awesome it was awesome the guys the camera guys were all getting sick Whoa, slow down and they asked me for a seat upgrade i'm like do you really think i'm gonna be able to get your recaro with big bolsters that does the flip and fuck fold and stow and go shit no sorry guys um anyway <clears throat> as cars have gotten taller so a tall short wheelbase car has a lot of uh, of weight transfer back under acceleration and they're the worst um you you drive something like like a, a perfect example would be I'm trying to think of something like a like a mazda cx3 front wheel drive car in san francisco on a 35 percent grade which we do have here um and you try to start out in the rain yeah which, not happening you just 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 yeah just spins the front tires and you can't even move um that wasn't the case when cars were 2400 pounds or 2200 pounds um they could go a friend of mine had a mark ii golf non-gti in high school and it was in a parking spot in san francisco and it had it was like stock and shitty and uh needed to have people sitting on the front of the hood in order to have enough traction to pull out of a parking spot on a oh hill. Oh my God, what tires did he have on it? I don't know, they were probably They were gone, they were just... 1990. Um, this is neither here nor there. So what is your argument? You said when cars were 2,400 pounds, what now? They had a, they had a moderate amount of horsepower. <laughs> a quick car in the 19, mid-80s, for example, was a nine-second car to 60. Nine seconds to 60 in a 
2,400 pound car, which was probably the average weight of a, of a compact or midsize car at that point, 100 horsepower was all, all it took. So 100 pound feet of torque, 120 pound feet of torque was all you needed. And they could put that down. Modern cars have way too much power to be able to put down, especially once you're turbocharged. Um, and so they've done tricks like, you know, the diff in your golf, but the diff in your golf only helps in corners. It doesn't help on a straightaway. What about, I've, I've heard unequal length drive shafts can potentially help too. That helps with torque steer. Yes. Sorry. That's what I was, uh, torque steer mm-hmm. rather than, oh, you're talking about just putting power yeah, down. Putting down. Um, torque steer, we, the best, the best thing you can do to filter out torque steer is put electric power steering, which filters everything else out. <laughs> that's why your, your golf has no steering feel. Your GTI yeah, and my yeah. golf, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and it's. I think they're on equal length half shaft. They have to be. Um, there's there are a bunch of different ways you can get rid of it, but then you just filter it out from the steering. Sadly, the yeah. uh, to return to the CX. I've been reading a lot about the CX, as you can tell. <laughs> um, no, let, let's do this as quickly as possible. No, it's fine. Uh, they put the engine in backwards, and, and by that I mean that the uh, intake was on the, the front, and the exhaust went down the back. And then the transmission was behind the engine, and so they had to run the shaft, one of the drive shafts. Wait, wait, it's longitudinal? Transverse. Okay, it's transverse, and the Intake is on the front. Okay. Exhaust comes out the back. That's not backwards, that's forwards. Oh, mine is backwards, because it's the other way around. Sorry. When they put the overhead cam engine in, they (laughs) switched the orientation from from, uh, forwards to backwards. Okay. (laughs) But the ones that have it in forwards... Uh, and because of something related to the routing of the exhaust, they had the drive shaft run through uh, the. It's very through, st- through the exhaust manifold. No, no, it's it's below all of that. It's um, man. Now I need a schematic because I've confused myself. Yeah, I like uh, this. This is what happens when oh, we record after lunch. Oh, what they did is they. <laughs> They had an idler shaft, basically. So the drive shafts were the same length, and then they ran a shaft to the other drive shaft, but it was basically like a shaft that was just turning there that was not related to any turning um, of the, the I drive think, That was right, not a drive shaft. That was actually done a lot in the 70s and 80s on front-wheel drive cars to give them equal length drive shafts yes. to stop torque steer. Yes, so that's um, what they apparently they did in that situation. I think it was also done for packaging reasons. Yeah, apparently they, there's you know there's an idler on it, and then the, so the half shafts themselves are even, but yes. then there's a there's a fixed half shaft that goes between the tranny output. And yes, on like one the, side, uh, right to to one of the drive Honda, shafts. I think Honda did that too for years. A hmm. um, bunch of car cars. Here's the here's the big drawback with with the 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 positive and negative side of front wheel drive was you typically have a transverse engine. And that typically. actually, typically, and that really you, does give packaging. Once you, once you um, coalesce this, the conventions around front-wheel drive packaging, because that didn't really happen until the Mini. Mini. 1959. Well, that happened in the Mini, and then a lot of car companies didn't adopt that. Correct. So, for example, Audi still hasn't, right? Audi yes. still uses longitudinal front-wheel drive uh, Saab layout. Saab 900. Saab 900 was also longitudinal and backwards and canted at a 45 degree because it was half of a Stag V8. I don't know if you know that. The Saab 900's four-cylinder, the 99, excuse me, initially, the original four-cylinder was half of a Stag V8, which is why it was at a 45-degree angle. The back of the motor, i.e. the output shaft, was at the front. The yes, belts were at I the back. Yes, I did know that. Right, and then the, cha- that. the transmission was underneath and on a chain drive. Completely <sighs> batshit nuts. Look under the hood of any uh, Saab no, 900. I, yeah, and I have definitely done that and been just boggled. Thing. Cool, like clutch, 10 minutes. Back Alternator, with- four days. Water pump, Light it Never. On fire. Yeah. Um, and there are so, so the other interesting thing that I, that I knew is Renault also did a longitudinal front out, what I call the Audi layout, longitudinal where the engine's completely in front of the front wheels, which is why when moving it back to the back of the R5 to make the R5 turbo, um, oh, very it became mid engine. Very mid engine. Yep. But that layout continued. Oh, and they didn't have to turn anything around. They literally oh, just moved it, it up, directly back. Because yeah. normally when you put things in the back, then you have to rotate it. No, you never do. Then the car would go backwards. Everyone thinks that. So Sorry, like the, if, if it's a rear-engine car. Like imagine the DeLorean, for example. The DeLorean, or the A110. Yeah. The DeLorean, yeah. Rear-engine cars, you're flipping shit. We're, like yes, 911, like 911 and 911 Cayman. Yes, how yeah. everything... Like, isn't it upside down? It's upside down, yeah. Yes. Um, but the interesting one always... I worked for Chrysler when I was in college. Like we did displays at malls and whatever. And we had... This was in the mid, mid-90s? mid Yeah, mid-90s. And we had like neon... Hi. Uh, remember the ads? Um, 
<clears throat> I worked for mostly Plymouth, but we had we did Plymouth Place and then Chrysler Showcase. And Chrysler Showcase had the Chrysler's and the 300M and the LH cars came out. So the Chrysler LHS, the Dodge Intrepid, the 300M. Concord. The Concord. And they were longitudinal front drive cars. And I could never figure out why Chrysler would do this because the minivans, everything else was transverse. Uh, Legend, Acura Legend 2 was like this. Yes, early Legend was. But do you know why the Chrysler, this is the wackest shit. Do you know why Chrysler was longitudinal? Do tell. Do you remember the Renault Alliance? Oh, no. Chrysler bought Renault's Alliance and all of the that whole platform and continued to develop. The LH cars were a Renault. Did you? I mean, this now sounds knew? familiar. Right. But like, what the hell? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the front engine. I mean, it was this beautiful three and a half liter quad cam V6 at the very, very, very front. And like, you know, Bentley layout now, Audi Bentley layout. In front. Well, until the current Continental, right? Or is it still the new Continental the, is not like the that, new right? Conti is actually a Panamera, which is a traditional front engine rear drive layout. With, so the first gen the Conti behind it. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah. got it. It's a, but it's their four wheel drive, so it doesn't make a difference. That's yes, a so what it is is power take off. It's power take off because all they all use the same ZF eight speed, so it's power mm-hmm. takeoff that goes front and just mm-hmm. wicks itself around the oil pan. Um, but so I people were doing about. longitudinal, like uh, still are, yeah, still are now. Also, I guess like Subaru. Audi Q um, five, Q all of the everything that's that's Audi that's not actually a Volkswagen. So A3 and TT, TT's not dead, but A3 is a Volkswagen. So A3, S3, R3. Everything, excuse me, on... So all the five-cylinder cars that they have made since they reintroduced five cylinders are all transverse. TT, They did one... R S three. Yes. Yeah. They, they, also, do, they have not like, made them in the modern era. They have not made a longitudinal five-cylinder. I don't think so. Unless you count that half of an <coughs> R8 V10, because those are longitudinal. <coughs> Still have this cough. And, and by the way, for the record, I just celebrated my 20 years of not smoking. So this is not a smoker cough. Congratulations. Is that, does that disqualify it from being, how many years after quitting smoking when you cough, does I, it not have, does it count to not be a smoker's cough? I mean, I think it's actually 10 days. <laughs> I don't know, but it's been 20 years since I've touched a cigarette. Yeah. Um, imagine how I'd be coughing with this COVID 2022 <clears throat> if I am still smoking. Anyway. Um, so the transverse arrangement was like kind of transcendent when it arrived in 1959. I think that probably somebody experimented it in the early days of automobiling when everything was wild west. I suspect that at some point somebody did something like that because just everyone was doing everything. Mm-hmm. If you go to like 1904 or something like that, and there's all these sort of like, no, no, wait, the Hupmobile of 1906. And like, I'm sure there's some example of that. But I would say that the Mini is the car that in in general terms commercialized that layout. And it became the, I would say, de facto setup for anybody who has any interest in packaging things mm-hmm. efficiently. I mean, that's the beauty of that car generally, or, or of that layout generally, mm-hmm. is that you concentrate all the mechanical systems in front of the passenger right. compartment. And it, and it helps a lot with things you wouldn't think about, like NVH, noise, vibration, and harshness. So most front engine, front wheel drive, transverse engines now have the exhaust on the front side mm-hmm. rather than the back side. So my VWs have the exhaust on the back side, and they're obviously very loud. You know that. But you know most of them now, including your GTI, I believe, has moved to the front side of the motor. Get that further away from the passenger compartment. I mean, what it does is heat everything else behind it, but whatever. You can, you can manage that with air. Um, you have... All this other efficiency, you lose the drive shaft, for example. Yes, and that's a that's a couple. And that's horsepower. true in, in uh, longitudinal uh, arrangements as well. Yeah, I mean longitudinal arrangements. Let's see. So early production front wheel drive cars. This would probably be the nineteen twenties. Cord L twenty nine. All the coffin noses. The um, who else was doing Citroen Traction Avant, which would be the thirties. Traction avant is... I'm going to keep my mouth shut because every time you mention a car, you're going to have to find an insert, a picture of that car, and you're going to have to give it to Paolo. So I'm going to... For efficiency purpose, I'm just going to go, mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. yep. <laughs> sure, what next. What early front-wheel drive other cars? I'm trying to think what the earliest front-wheel drive car I've ever driven was. It probably was just an original Mini. Because um, there really wasn't all that much before then, was there? Um, I mean, DS was what year? 1955. But the Traction Avant was the, the car before right. that, 1930. I've never driven a Traction Avant. I'm interested to drive a Traction Avant. A tractor Avant. Well, Is that a wagon that's traction a Traction in the front. 
Well, it's tractable, but it's a wagon. It's an Avant. Oh. <laughs> Audis. <God>. Yes. <laughs> um, a term yeah. which was invented for the Audi 100, this first generation, speaking of longitudinal five-cylinder engines, with the radiator next to I'm the I'm trying Audi. to think of like what cars really, really, when did that front-wheel drive layout really take off? And I think it was late 1970s. I mean, VW did 1974 was their... Golf. Was, was the original Golf. Um, and then all the American car companies followed shortly thereafter with their... I mean, you had things like, you know, the 1960s Oldsmobile Toronado. That's a longitudinal. Longitudinal front wheel drive and Cadillac experiment. Eldorado mm-hmm. was doing that at the same time but I think that packaging you know the, what transverse, it, the package, transverse package I mean that yeah so Peugeot 205 for sure that was later though was it 80s yes that's into yeah. the 80s Golf is probably one of the 74. most defining mm-hmm. right and I, I feel like I'm forgetting something American Fiat Ritmo German. and Delta those were all in the 70s also when did Honda really start with their front wheel drive push the like the front wheel drive front engine transverse stuff that had to be in around Oh, God, we should know this. We should know I this. mean, the CVCC was, that was definitely front engine transverse, and that was 73. 73. Mm. So I think that had to be trans, transverse. Oh. It's me. I've never opened the hood of one. Complex. We have reached control. the outer limits of Carmungeon <laughs> knowledge. No, it's because Talking it's all about it's Honda stuff. We're terrible at, at Japanese stuff. Yeah, all we are. People are always like, you should do this about Japanese cars. I'm like, I'm Ooh. sorry. I don't know anything about Japanese cars. Um, I'm trying. Trying. I own one now. That counts for something. It's transverse. Uh, <laughs> it's rear, sure. Rear wheel drive. Um, yeah. So anyway, anyway so the, the advantages were obviously compactness of the of the, the power unit. You didn't have a drive shaft, which meant you didn't have to have a hump between the two seats. You mm-hmm. had, you know, you could rot the exhaust in a smaller hump and be done with it. Um, and so, unfortunately, front wheel drive cars tended to be associated with economy cars. Because, you know, if you needed to get MPG out of... Yeah, and so maybe uh, what it, what actually was was a sort of Trojan horse way of being elitist against economy cars. This whole push-pull oh, push thing push. and the superiority of rear-wheel drive. Well, I think... I, the other thing is I think that the car companies hadn't really yet figured out how to make... That's bullshit. No, think, think about GTI. the Mini. Well, and Mini the, was fun as shit. The GTI was fun as shit, yeah. yeah. I think most of the car companies just made them shitty because they were economy cars. I think that's what it really was. It, they existed for purposes of yes, they were not. Their primary purpose was not driving enjoyment, right. and so people thought that they didn't like um, front wheel drive. But what they actually didn't like was just like Shit low boxes. horsepower right. economy cars. Because if I, if you ask me today, what the most fun cars that are on sale? Uh, there's, I will give you a list that will definitely include the Veloster N, sure, yep. which is front wheel drive, and probably even that stupid fucking mini. That Mini Cooper JCW GP thing with a crazy front front wheel drive. If it had a manual, it'd be really fun. But mm-hmm. stupid fun. Yeah. From, you know, I think that I th- we've well, got the hot hatch era really defined that it caused people's consciousness to shift on that idea. Certainly, it did mine. I mean, I so I've owned four front wheel drive cars. I own two of them now. One of them was the E Golf, and the other one was the Peugeot four hundred and five Mi sixteen. Mm. That was my first ever front wheel drive. Really. Car. Yeah. Only Derek Tamscott would say my first ever front wheel drive car was a four hundred five Mi sixteen. No, you were one. Oh, of six and I owned people. a one sixty four S. Oh, Sorry, that's, that's true. Fifth, Hold on, but I owned the Peugeot first. You did? Yes. No, oh. I swear there's another front wheel drive car in there somewhere. It's got to be. I'm judging you harshly because I'm trying to think of how many front wheel drive cars I've had, and I think you have me beat. What? No. All I mean, of your like Mark threes and I have, so I have three Golf, three Volkswagens right now. All right. Technically, I had a different cabri- cabriolet, so I'll count that. That's four. You um, had a Mark III. I had a Mark III that I swapped a VR6 into. That's five. Is that the only... Bolt? I mean, I had a Toyota Corolla for a while there. Yeah. Okay, I mean, that was winning. stupid. You're not winning. But that doesn't really count. As, as a proportion of all the cars we've ever owned, I think you have me crucified. Uh, as being front-wheel drive? No, because I've owned more cars than you have, and you have owned mm, more front-wheel drive cars. You probably have. Yes. So five in my life of all the cars that I've ever owned. There's got to be something else in there. Mm. So you've ever only owned four Volkswagen? Oh, two E-Golfs. Oh, shit. Does it really count if it, look, if it doesn't count it's as the, the same, same car. damn car. The two cabbies and the Scirocco. You the soul oh, shit. into a new vehicle. What other daily drivers did I ever have that were, because I just tend to think of a, a front-wheel drive car as a daily, which is so wrong because it flies in the face of this whole argument. But I, I mean, know. certainly I learned from you that front-wheel drive could be joyful. Up until that point, I was just like, I will never own a front wheel drive car. I mean, I purposely, the criteria that I was looking for when I bought my first car was like, I wanted to have 
more than f- four cylinders and I want it to be rear wheel drive. Mm-hmm. And that was the, that those were the only, and I wanted it to be a manual. Mm-hmm. That hasn't changed. Yes. Thank God. But the yes. rest of it, I mean. And so I was just like, there's no way that it could be fun. And then I think I experienced your cabbie the same day that you drove my 308 for the first time. Yeah. That would be the 28th of February, 2016. Uh, and that was the day where I was like, okay, front wheel drive's all right. Um, I have pictures of you smiling. Yes. That, that was that was very funny to put together all the pictures of you smiling because you couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> it's so hilarious. The That car, I'm telling you, but the the... Years and years ago, when I was at Automobile, we went, we did a track day at Grattan Raceway, which is like, no, yes, Grattan, uh, which is in Michigan, and it's the most insane track in the world because there's a jump in the middle of the track on it, like just crazy track, it's nuts. But I was there with uh, my coworker Sam Smith and a whole bunch of his friends, and they all had E30 M3s, and I, everyone, they all brought E30s. There was a couple of E30s. There was a, uh, a Targa 9, 911 Targa that our friend Chaffee owned, um, and there I was in the Scirocco, and then car and driver showed up with a bunch of their press cars <clears throat> and their interns and their idea of Mike Duchesne who ran car driver.com thought this is a great opportunity for this open track day to bring out a bunch of younger people and show them what it's like to be on a racetrack. So he had a bunch of senior editors like him and, and uh, Eric Johnson and a bunch of other guys drive around all of the interns in cool cars. And there was an Avora. No, I think it was an Exige. I'm going to go find these pictures. I think it, there was some sort of Lotus. There was definitely an AMG CLK 63 black series there. Um, A bunch of like really high horsepower cars. And the deal was they could stand in line at whatever parking spot and the car would come in and they'd, you know, jump into whatever. And at one point there was no one waiting for anything except for seven people in line to get a ride in the Scirocco. (laughs) Because Mike had said to them, they're like, I was coming around driving driving like a jerk, of course, trying to get away from the E30 M3s, which I couldn't. But I was holding them all up for a while. And so I, I kept coming around this corner with opposite lock. And what I did was I On just... three wheels. Two and a half. Stiffened the rear suspension, put the rear bar on full, and the car did not understeer. It steady stayed oversteered. And it was just fun as shit. Turn in and just, you know, manage the rear end with the power. And he said to them all, like, look at this. Like, this is where the industry has failed you. When you read somewhere that front-wheel drive cars cannot be made to turn properly and can't be made to be neutral remember this moment and they all, everyone wanted to ride in the, in the stupid side of Scirocco. Um, it was a really fun day, but it was great to see that these younger, these kids were like, Oh, we just want to experience that. Forget about the black series. Forget about mm-hmm. the, uh, Oh yeah. They just wanted to feel like close to death. Yeah. That's what we all seek. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> exactly. With cars, proximity to death. It's exactly what you feel like in an old Volkswagen. Yes. Um, but yeah, I could not believe after a week of driving the Lotus, you know, and I've seen this car's praises all the time and I love it. But so why do you own it? Or are you going to sell it now? The, it is such a palate cleanser for steering that it's important for me to keep that for my job. Because whenever I'm talking about steering purity, I have to get back in that car to reset. You know, it's the, the watermelon between the whatever, whatever they give you. for. Yeah, yeah. The, it's, the, uh, it starts with a G, granita. It's a know. little ice thing. A little thing a little with place like... place of ice. Water. Yeah. You just need... It's got the best steering of any car ever made. And... You know, I drove um, that E30 on our European rally, and that was just terrible unassisted steering. Sorry for, sorry to the owner of that car. Sorry, sorry. But, you know, some guy got mad at me on Instagram for saying <coughs> bad things about the E30's manual steering. The E30's manual steering was so fucking slow, it's just not good. You can't control the car. Uh, the Lotus is like two and a half turns or whatever it is, lock to lock. It's quick. It's still really light even when you're stopped, um, and it's fingertip light once you're moving. Because the car weighs nothing. Yeah, but it's you can do that, you know the the you can do that with proper engineering. The, and the example there is the Alpha Four C, which isn't that much heavier. It's four four or five hundred pounds heavier, and the steering is annoyingly heavy at all times. Um, and so the Lotus exists for purity, and it's one thousand nine hundred ninety two pounds. And it you know the the problem with that car is the motor. You know I bought the supercharged car because I wanted to not. That Toyota 2ZZ is okay. So this is a question: Why are the why is the motor character so deficient in that compared to a Honda when they're like similar displacement, similar red lines, same horsepower, similar specific outputs? Yeah, I mean, you compare that to I, I don't know. So the thing about the, I, what I was going to say is I would sell the Lotus tomorrow if somebody offered me a Series Two 
with a K20 swap. I mean, the one that we drove that Series 1, that was it's K20A, and it was no faster, I'm sure, than my supercharged Elise. But oh my God, the noises it made were just so complex and there was so much going on. And, you know, you opened the throttle and it almost sounded turbocharged because you could hear the whistle of the of air rushing past the intake. And then under load, it just made a totally different noise. And then the valve timing changing. The the Toyota 2ZZ is just... I mean, it's an appliance motor for an appliance car and then they just took it out not. and put it in it, something else. It's a Yamaha... It's a Yamaha... You know, yeah, but this, wasn't it intended for use? Well, I guess it was for the Celica primarily. Celica GTS and Matrix XRS mm-hmm. and Corolla, but but regular yeah. Corolla or was there a spicy Corolla? There was a spicy Corolla, but um, it's I don't know. There's something. It doesn't. What it doesn't do is doesn't change personality. It's the same note no, no that gets higher. Yes, right. you don't like that. No, I I like progression. Progression at different times and at different like I like resonances and in typical Toyota's fashion, it's probably just too perfect, right? It's just too meticulously refined refined to get rid of any buzzes and every vibrations and whatever with a Honda motor. It's just stupidly characterful. Char- yeah. So if I could find a Series 2 with a K-Swap that was legal to register in California because of that fucking smog thing we discussed, great. Um, but until then, the VWs wind up being more, way more fun. And I know that anyone listening to this must be like thinking, what, is he crazy? But I'm... Um, you drive have to a, drive them. Drive a spicy Mark One Volkswagen. Drive a spicy. Go drive a Hyundai Veloster N, and then go drive a Cayman, and tell me which one's more fun. Because right now, Veloster N, Elantra N, any of them, crucifies, crucifies a, a four cylinder, seven eighteen. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, not a high bar. Every time <coughs> I hear one of those drive by, I'm just like, Ugh, why? Because some asshole in engineering decided i'm sure it's i know what it was it was co2 you know it was it was emissions and fuel economy regs the great joke of the whole matter is the old six cylinders did better on epa than the four cylinders <laughs> really yep one uh, mile per gallon better regardless of transmission or convert like boxster versus came in if you chose whatever whatever trim level base to s to gts each of them was one mile per gallon better with the six cylinder mm. so Four Let's cylinders see. faster. In its defense, four cylinders faster. Yeah, more no torque, one cares. Right. I guess down low in the typical turbocharged well, form. It's, yeah, it's area under the curve, right? Yes. Um, plus, I think the the turbo fours actually make more power than the than the sixes did anyway. But that's not what you don't buy a Boxster and be like, oh, I bought this new Porsche and my it got thirty two miles to the gallon on the highway. No one does that. It's a nice thing. Like, hey, my Boxster actually gets twenty eight on the highway. That's pretty cool because it's amazing. So many other yeah, ways. But you have to look at the holistic experience, right. and this is where oftentimes German manufacturers fall down: is that they get sort of myopically focused on certain metrics instead of the entire experience. You just this is why we stop like right now. This is why we like what uh, Andy Preuninger. It's why I like American. Like it's why I like a lot of American cars. Like no one is sitting there at Dodge going, well, you know, that Hellcat motor, insert name of anything they make, is really going to hurt our cafe credit. Someone's like, fuck it. If somebody wants to pay $10,000 more in, in like EPA fines for this car, great. We love them because they want a 700 horsepower V8 rear wheel drive burnout machine. I love that. Um, yeah, the world is ending. The automotive world is ending. And we're all going to wind up with like fucking front wheel drive electric shit boxes. Like, you know, like, like you already, art, have, like I already have. Like I have done in the past and <laughs> right. been reformed. And liked. I did like it. I liked it quite well as a transportation device. Um, yeah, so I, I think that this front wheel drive bias that exists in the car world results from a lot of things. But at its core, it's probably there are some limitations associated with it. Uh, and if you're looking for outright performance and or trying to put a ton of power in something, then it sort of starts, there's an outer limit of what's possible with front wheel drive. But if it's like enjoyment or driving or experience, uh, then it shouldn't be shat upon. Do you think that at some point everyone should have a rear wheel drive car to learn to drive properly, to handle power over steer and a slippy back end or mm-hmm. like just as a sort of automotive rite of passage? I think so. I think everyone should actually also own a 911 because the way I feel about this <coughs> is when you're dealing with learning how to control a car at the limit, you have a bunch of different rule books and a front wheel drive car is pretty simple. Yeah, oh yes, right? we talked about this. So we talked about this once where, you know, adding power will tend to tend to induce understeer. Adding way too much power will spin the wheels and induce a lot of understeer. A lift, lifting off, will tend 
every car is different, but most of them work the same way, uh, will tend to induce oversteer. So you're transferring weight back forward when you lift off the throttle. Less rear grip, Less so rear the back grip end is more inclined to come around. And some cars do really, really well. My VWs do great with this. You lift, you're spinning, right? And that was even out of the box. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you do a big lift at the top of second gear around, coming around a corner and you are fucking going into orbit. Which is a great way to rotate the car. If you're doing it on purpose, yeah, you can use that to your advantage. You're coming around a corner, you're going to miss your apex by three feet. You kind of just breathe off the throttle. The back end will tuck in and you'll you'll go. That step out, the front tucks in. Sorry, the front tucks in, the back steps out, right? Either way, but you can use that to adjust the line of the car. Then you have rear-wheel drive. Obviously, we've discussed what happens there, right? You can do the same thing. You can lift and induce, and, and induce oversteer on a lift in a rear-wheel drive car just as well. Um, so you're adding the ability to rotate the rear under power, which is what you don't have in a front-wheel drive car. So rear-wheel drive car builds on that but repertoire. But you can rotate on the front if you have a locking differential in a front-wheel drive car by tucking the front end. <sighs> kind of, yes, under power. But under you can't power. do it without adding a huge amount of speed, right? Yes. So like sort of like the beginner step would be like front car open diff. Next up is front drive car locker diff some sort of aggressive limited slip then you move up to rear wheel drive and rear wheel drive with limited slip and whatever then i think everyone should go to forget all-wheel drive cars because that depends totally on depends system, on right. some behave rear wheel drivey others i just drove drive. a fucking audi rs3 i have been shitting on hall decks for 20 years hall decks based front wheel drive cars can't fucking holy fuck that car turns like a goddamn rear wheel drive car i eat shit of everything i've ever said about every all-wheel drive system in the world motherfucker i can't wait to do an episode with that car really i, I did one lap of we, we had it for a drag race show for that v10 five cylinder i did one quickie lap just to cool it down once because it was 115 degrees and we we're doing quarter mile after quarter mile after quarter mile i'm like i'll just go and cool this down oh my god God, that thing is that all wheel drive system is now genuine Camisa seal of approved. Holy shit, epic! Feels like a real drive car, real drive car with supernatural traction. It's up there with Honda Super Handling all wheel drive, <sighs> Mitsubishi Evo. I mean, oh my god, I anyway. mean, I'm really interested to hear that. I'm delighted, honestly, to hear that because you want a I golf w- R now, what because you want a golf R now? No, I, oh, okay. w- I want an R, I want the five cylinder. Oh. I, I mean, I love five cylinders. I've owned a five cylinder Audi in the past. I, w- I I love the sort of history and the experience of interacting with five cylinders. And I periodically think about my GTI and what I might replace it with someday. If they only made a five cylinder GTI, like a Golf RS. Yes, or a um, an RS three manual Wagon. hatchback in the yeah. US. Amazing. Yeah. That would with be, that all-wheel drive system, that would be the first all-wheel drive. I don't really love that five cylinder. I'll be honest with you. It's really? it's good. It's really nice. But it doesn't have... But is it more character... I mean, this motor in the GTI is characterless. (laughs) Way more. Way more characterful than any of the four-cylinders. The current... Yeah. No, I would... that's the bar. An an RS3 hatch manual? Fuck. That... Anyway, so... Yeah, that's my dream. That's my dream daily. All-wheel drive is a different discussion. Yes, right. We got sidetracked. So start out front, go to rear, and then everyone should have a 911. Because that is the coolest thing in the world. That rule book is very simple. It You drive a 911 like a front-wheel drive car until you break traction. And then it becomes a rear-wheel drive car with a bunch of asterisks on top of it. That's Yes, yeah, about not over-applying power. Yeah. Controlling a 911 at the limit is the biggest automotive joy there is. God, is that... It's, it's, like- it's it, There's so many dimensions. It's so complex. It's so, like, adjustable. Mm-hmm. That's why when I get out of and I'm driving something other than a 911 fast, I feel like I'm my like my hands are tied a little bit because I have fewer levers that I can use to adjust the car's attitude, and so it becomes a little bit frustrating mm-hmm. to not have that, I see that. Uh, at my disposal. Mm-hmm. I can totally see that. The funny thing is, though, a really good front drive car, I never feel. Like I've never gotten out of the cabbie or the Scirocco and thought I even want more adjustability. I want more. It's because it's so assy. That's probably why, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, d- I have gotten out of the Lotus and thought, mm, it's not great at the limit. It kind of understeers, and I'm scared of it. Like, they understeer until they snap out. Right. And Snapped then once on me. It was fucking... Alarming. <laughs> was that before or after you had the blown shock fix? Before. Um, before. But it's still, those cars are just known. I've had some of the best experience in my life in on a racetrack in the Lotus Elise. So I know what they're capable of, and it's one of the best platforms I've ever driven. But in terms of... It's limit behavior on the street. They mostly understeer. 
my my the, th- the only three cars I never want to get sideways in are my three mid engine cars. It's the Beat, the Elise, and the Ferrari. I have no desire to get sideways in any of them ever, um, which is probably why I prefer front, front engine, engine cars. cars. Yeah, <coughs> I get it. Or nine elevens. I mean, a nine eleven sideways is the most magic thing in the fucking world. You just got to be super awake. Well, you better have ABS and stability control because the thing is, everything's fine until you need to hit the brakes. And that's where prior to stability control, 911s were not, shouldn't have been legal. Sorry. Yeah, widow makers. Yeah. And it wasn't, they're fine. You can control them. And the problem is you're coming around a corner, you're understeering a little bit, everything's fine. It's all good. Car steps out a little bit because you lifted or you hit a bump and you turn it into this beautiful drift. You catch it back and then there's a, stopped car in front of you what do you do yeah if you have any yawing motion on the car and you stand on the brakes it's just forget game it. over forget it like you know you can manage it you can get them sideways you can unget them sideways they don't really want to spin if you're you know within 10 degrees as long as you don't chop the throttle or to cause a sudden weight right. transfer or need to stop because conditions yeah. change you're coming around a corner and there's something there that you didn't expect or the light turns red or whatever or there's a fucking deer that's where i draw the line and say 911s that's when it goes from like this is the best thing in the world to well God, it was I hope nice being belts. alive <laughs> <laughs> i hope my seatbelts work yeah all right we have discussed front wheel mm-hmm. drive and come to the conclusion that it don't suck Shit. yeah as long as you have a properly set up car which is tr- generally true about any car right you there's shitty rear wheel drive cars there's joyful front wheel drive cars there's also the inverse is true. shitty rear wheel drive cars yeah drive like a chevette 19- don't ever say that word in front of me again I've never driven one. Me neither. But it does. I've driven a Fiero and it has the same front suspension. Backwards? <laughs> no, it's the same front suspension. Oh, yeah. It was a citation right. engine. Backwards. Not backwards. Move to the Move rear. to the rear. You yeah. don't spin an engine around backwards. Yeah. Unless you put it in a 911. Okay. Okay. Uh, this has been episode 72, Something. I think. Uh, next one, next episode, hypothetically, would be the um, Q&A. Q&A, yeah. So if you haven't yet, you might be able to... You, you might, but it might also be that we are you are watching this while we're recording that episode, in which case we won't answer these questions. But in case that's not the case, because we should probably finish our sentence for those people who haven't listened last week, we are doing a Q&A episode, potentially the next episode. And so you should email us at videoquestions at haggerty.com and we will try to answer your cues. We will A, your cues. Yes. If not, potentially. maybe not. Maybe we'll wait. If the questions suck, we can just ignore them. Yes. Make up our own my life. Is that okay? All right. Tune in the next time for the Commergent Show, which is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network.